from our spring break slides, two of six that we're going to go over. Let me pull this up. Okay, so the name of this one is called Mount St. Victory. It's ball. It's by Paul Cezanne, 1902 to 1904, so two years. Oil on Canvas. This is located in Philadelphia Museum of Art. The size is 2.3 feet, so two feet, three inches by three feet. And Cezanne, he is part of the Impressionism slash post movement. Okay, so he's kind of starting to, to break away um, from some of the artists in the past of this time. Again, he's pulling away from that academia. And we can definitely see that being displayed here in the way that he is representing this mountain in this landscape scene. So a couple things you need to just know for context wise about Cezanne, we can just start there. He is known for two things, okay? So please write this down. Still lives of apples, fascinating, okay? Um, and number two is gonna be this particular landscape, Mount St. Victory. He actually, at some point, he buys acres of land here, um, really close to probably where he's actually painting this particular scene. And he knows this mountain better than probably anybody. He paints it several, several times in some of his paintings. Um, so just to kind of understand a little bit about his background. So originally he starts off doing still lifes. Okay, things that are, excuse me, small of apples. Okay, then he's going to take a left-hand turn and go into something very large totally out of bounds, going into landscapes, okay? Those, so those are two various uh, different types of genre paintings that we're, we're focusing on, all right? Um, his hometown is near Mount St. Victory. Um, it's south of France. It's called Axe in Provence, and it's spelled A-I-X-E-N-Provence, P-R-O-V-E-N-C-E. So, a couple things. When you're looking at this initially, you know it's a mountain. You see it. It looks like a mountain. And then you see a landscape down below. Okay? However, he's going to be on this track of another artist that we're going to come to in the 20th century named Picasso, where he's going to start to um, look at painting more in an abstract way. And what I mean by abstract, I mean... We realistically know that this is not how the mountain looks. We don't see these patches, but however, he's playing on the ideal of light. He's playing on the ideal that everything can be broken into smaller shapes, okay? And I think you can kind of clearly see that. You can kind of see just where he's taking his paintbrush and he's just dabbing certain colors in certain areas. You can see various um, blues you can see pretty much a whole monochromatic of blues from darks to lights. Grays are mixed in there, so you can kind of get a sense that there is a little bit of some depth going on. Um, and then the same can speak for the actual landscape itself down below. You can see various greens from mono in a monochromatic standpoint. You can see the darks, the mediums to the lights. And again, pay attention to the way. It just looks like they're patches, patches of paint but we know it's a mountain, okay? So he's really basically just simplifying. He's making it more abstract um, objects that are visible in the world, okay? He's going to start to use more than one vantage point. So some of the buildings seem as if they're from above, while some other ones might seem like you can kind of see it from a side point more on frontally. Um, so again, he is part of that post-impressionist movement. He is going to, like I said earlier, please write this down, he's going to be a big, big, big influence with Picasso and other 20th century abstract artists. And we're going to go into a really crazy field when we get into 20th century very soon. We're going to be totally taken off our rocker when we start studying toilets as art. Okay, let me just leave that for another another day another conversation so basically what we're gonna um, continue to discuss is the composition let's get into a little bit about how he has this painting broken up it's divided into three equal somewhat equal did I put equal composition divided into three 
I guess that does say equal horizon sections. Um, they're elevated at certain viewpoints. So um, the first one being the band of foliage in the houses. Yeah, so I guess you can kind of see that being broken into three equal sections. So this section right here, okay. So if you want to just label broken, this is more of our foreground, okay. Then you got the vast plain as the middle ground, okay, right in the center. And then for the third, you have basically um, the mountains surrounded by sky. Okay, so you got your, your main mountain and then your sky behind it. Okay, and then also with the vast plain, sorry for that second part, um, you can see rough patches of the yellows and the greens like we said earlier. Again, it's just, it just looks very just patchy, just simplified, abstract. It almost reminds me of like a quilt, how it's just made up of like little sections. Okay, moving on. Almost done. We are going to talk a little bit about um, how he bought land here and what's significant about that. Because he buys some acres of land down in Les Lowe's, Les, yeah, I think that's how it's pronounced, L-E-S, uh, new word, L-A-U-V-E-S. Um, basically, why this is important, and I need for you to just jot this down, is he builds a studio here um, from this viewpoint right here where we're standing. And if you actually really want to see what it looks like, it looks pretty similar. I can see a lot of similarities between the two. Um, this is where he would paint, okay? Um, and he's really focused on that mountain, okay? Basically, he's he's documenting. He's documenting here. Um, he loved this place so much that he would bring other artists that were friends. Um, he brought someone, uh, Denise and Rosell, who they specialized in oil painting and photography. So getting some various other types of mediums involved. Um, so basically, he is aware. So if someone was to look at this coming from the academia standpoint, um, he's aware of how his art is roughly finished. Okay, it looks rough. It reminds me of our one um, Stonebreakers piece where it just it looks kind of rough and patchy, um, and that's supposed to kind of allude to the flatness and the depth of this particular painting. Um, he was known for climbing and exploring this mountain, like I said earlier. He knew the distance. Um, again, he was probably one of those people that really knew this mountain the best, okay? Um, and I think it gets into a little bit more deep. He's kind of a, gets deep. Um, if you were catching up on his, on his writings that were found in the Khan article, um, entire days in mountains where he would be reading Virgil and looking at the sky. Therefore, high horizons, intense blues, and vibrant reds. Cezanne's legend was beginning to emerge and a mountain ran right through it. So this was really, really important for his career is painting this particular um, mountain scene over and over and over over again. Okay, so again, this comes from a series. Um, it's a painted of this mountain various viewpoints, um, different relationships of, are constantly changing with other elements, you know, the way that nature works. Some trees could be there one day and the next day they're not there. So paying just, you know, paying attention to nature. Um, he really liked painting in this particular spot. And let me just see. I guess the only, to wrap this one up, this one's going to be it, um, just paying attention to where that horizon line is. It's not directly in the center, so it's a little off center. It's almost like it's like one third. And if you were to, when we were going back, dividing this into thirds, that would kind of justify how this is not completely centered right. Um, it's, it's right above it. Okay. So that plays kind of an important role as far as how your eye leads, where it's going to kind of go on like this diagonal. It's almost like a triangle. Okay. That you see as you kind of, um, identify that this is a mountain and then you see the trees down below and looking over my notes. I'm at the end. All right. Mrs. Howard signing out.